Good yeah. afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another Big Data London webinar. Uh, today, we're focusing on data governance. So I'm Andy Steed, Content Director of Big Data London, and I'm joined today by two friends of the show, uh, Nicola Ascombe, the data governance trainer, who's one of our steering group, and um, a past speaker and potential future speaker, Tariq Batty from uh, Nursing and Midwifery Council. Hi, guys. Hi. Um, Hi. Yes, so uh, the format of today's one will be uh, a presentation by Nicola. Um, we're using slides and then we'll be having a chat with Tariq in a, in a Q&A about his, uh, his experiences with uh, data governance. Um, like all sessions we do, though, uh, they're designed to be interactive. So please send in any questions you have uh, during the sessions and I'll endeavour to ask them to the uh, participants um, at the end or, or, or after each, each session. So a uh, quick uh, house point, uh, housekeeping point. Um, if you lose uh, the stream at any point, just click reload on your browser and you should rejoin straight away. You shouldn't lose the stream, but just in case. Um, but without further ado, I'd like to pass on to our first presenter here. Uh, over to you, Nicola. Thank you very much, Andy. So let me just share my slides. So um, this, uh, I'm going to have a talk to you about minimal data governance. And um, it's actually a topic that I, I covered at a, a webinar a couple of weeks ago, but it seems to be such a um, valuable topic. And it is something that um, is so topical right now um, that when, when I was talking to Andy and because they said kind of, would I share my thoughts on it with you all as well? So um, let, let's have a look at this. So I've been doing data governance for um, 17 years now, which is really scary when I think about it. And I, I think it's fair to say in the early days, I was a bit of an evangelist. But that's a word I really hate to use now. But I definitely was in the early days. I wanted to do everything and I wanted to govern all data perfectly. Now, I worked for a bank at the time, so you can imagine how much data they had. Me saying everything had to be perfect didn't go down all that well. Um, you know, it felt like I was just standing at the top of an ivory tower and preaching and, and telling people that all data had to be um, done properly. And I'll be honest, it really got me nowhere at all. So I've learned over the years that you've got to be very practical and pragmatic when you're doing data governance. Not only you know, can you not do data governance over everything, I've, I've really learned through experience that it's not useful to. Not all of the data in your organization it has the same value. So we need to consider carefully where we put our data governance focus on. But I would say in the current climate, that is more important now than it ever has been. So I started wondering if there's any further I can go in becoming more pragmatic. And, you know, to be honest, I don't know what the opposite of an evangelist is. Probably is a pragmatist, um, but it's definitely <laughs> what I've become over the years. And it's an interesting position to be in because what we're facing now is that demand for data governance is increasing as a result of coronavirus. There's more and more focus on data because people want to have the confidence that they've got the right data and that it's good enough quality to make decisions about what they're doing with their business because these decisions might be the ones that enable their survival at this time. But at the same time, as we've got demands going up, you know, everybody's suffering from budgets being cut. People don't want to spend money on data governance, but they want more of it. So we've got this conundrum. If we're going to deliver data governance, it's got to deliver some benefits. Believe me, I love doing it, but there really is no point doing data governance just for the fun of it. Um, you know, you've got to deliver benefits to your organization, but how are you actually going to do that if you've got little or no budget? So it feels like what we're facing now is more than ever before, a requirement to deliver data governance on a shoestring. Now, being a bit of a data governance geek, and I'm sure Tarek will like this one as well, I do love the definitions. So I thought we better have a definition of shoestring. <laughs> and this is what I found. You know, basically, it's what we all knew anyway, but this is the proper one. It's a small or inadequate budget. And I think that probably sums up what I was saying on the previous slide. This is what people want us to do now. We're facing a situation where we're being asked to deliver benefits on an inadequate budget. So the question I asked myself was, but what can we really do that's useful on that basis? Because if we put in place something called data governance now that isn't well received, doesn't deliver any value and isn't going to be scalable in the future, then to be honest, we've wasted ever time and effort resources that we have now but to be honest not only that 
but we've made it harder to do a subsequent attempt or roll out data governance in the future. And this is something I've come across so many times over the years. If your first attempt at data governance is done poorly and is badly received, then your subsequent attempts are going to be even harder and even more challenging to do successfully. So if we're going to do a minimal approach, we need to make sure we do something useful that won't make it harder for us to do it properly in the future. So we really, we've got to work out how pragmatic we can be, but still deliver some results and set us up for the future. So um, no big challenge there then. <laughs> so let's have a look at another definition. I told you I, I, I like a good definition. So <laughs> when I first heard the term data governance on a shoestring, I, I didn't make it up. I really like the sound of it. Yeah, data governance on a shoestring. That just sums up what a lot of us are facing. And I think you agree this isn't a bad definition, is it? You know, a minimum approach to proactively managing data quality. But then you get to the example. And I start thinking, how many of you would be happy to speak on a, on a webinar like this or at an event and say, oh, yes, my company implemented data governance on a shoestring? You know, it doesn't sound like something to be proud of, to be honest, does it? It sounds like something you've probably done cheaply or not properly. Yeah, so, to, be honest, to be honest with you, Nicola, at least they are doing data governance. Well, that's, that's very true. <laughs> it doesn't sound like something to be you know, proud of, I suppose. So we kind of, it got me to have this conclusion that you know, perhaps this wasn't going to be a good title for the approach after all. So I had a little bit of a tweak at the title and came up with the, the title that I've used for, for this little bit of the presentation, Minimal Data Governance. And if you look closely, because I know being data people, you will, the definition hasn't changed at all. But what I've changed is the example. And I'm hoping that if this was you, you'd be happy to say, my company implemented a minimal data governance uh, you know, initially. Because that gives the impression that you know, we took a sensible, practical approach because you know, circumstances required it initially, but it was only the start of something bigger and better. And I think you know, this brings out the point that it's really vital to choose your words with care when you're doing data governance, especially when you're communicating about it which is what I've been trying to demonstrate here. You know, if we say we're going to do data governance on a shoestring, you're not going to be taken seriously. It doesn't have the right connotations. However, if you say we're going to do minimal data governance, I think it gives the impression that it's going to be something that isn't too much hard work, but is going to be worth doing, and, and perhaps we can manage to do it. It also gives the idea that this is just the start and more will follow. So... Yeah, you're probably sitting there listening, thinking that's all very well, Nicola, but what does this really mean in practice? So the following quotes have come from conversations that um, I've had many times over the years. And people say things to me like, um, can we do just enough to say that we're doing it? So that exactly what you just said, Tarek, you know, well, at least we're doing it. You know, we are doing data. And um, so we must be good people. You can trust us. Um, you know, or is it enough to keep the regulator off our back? And I can't tell you how many times, you know, prospective clients have said, you know, what's the minimum we have to do? You know, what's the bare minimum? You just think that's just not the right attitude. And, you know, finally, I have say people say, I've heard about this data governance thing. I hear it delivers all these benefits, but um, I just want something that's not going to take too much effort, please. And, you know, I think if you're thinking in, in any of these kind of ways, you're in the wrong frame of mind. And, I'll be honest, I don't think you're probably going to deliver anything of any value to your organization. And as I've already said, and it's a bit of a hobby horse of mine, it's going to make it harder for you to do data governance in the future if you do it from any of these viewpoints. Now, as you probably already noticed, I don't do slides with loads of words on it, but these ones I thought were important enough to be big in the middle of this slide. You know, let's really reinforce this message. Minimal data governance has to deliver real value to the organization. Oh, there's no point in doing it. This is all about focusing on delivering some value. Now, I know it's really easy for someone like me to say that, and you're probably listening thinking, well, that's great, Nicola, but how am I going to do that? So what you need to do first is start with why you're doing data governance in the first place. Now, I'm sure many of you have come across Simon Sinek. If you haven't heard of him, um, you know, I'm not saying you've got to go and buy his book, although I do recommend it. But he did a TED talk a few years ago. 
uh, which is absolutely fabulous. And I would encourage you to just spend 15 minutes watching that. Now, Simon Sinek was originally a marketing executive and did a lot of analysis on why the most successful marketing campaigns were so successful. And he came to the conclusion that the ones that were really successful started with why you needed the product, and not what the product was. And the Apple iPod is an example he gives in his TED Talk. I told you it was a while ago. <laughs> and Apple didn't tell us that we needed an iPod all those years ago. They sold us on the idea that, that we needed unlimited music wherever we went. And they explained how this was possible by having a device to take with you that wasn't limited by the weight of your Walkman and the pile of the CDs you had to carry with you. And it was only when they totally convinced us that we needed unlimited music did they tell us about the iPod. And what I'm trying to say to you really is you need to take that same approach with data governance. I can tell you from experience, nearly everybody starts with the what. And I did it the first few years of doing data governance, so I'm as guilty as everybody else. You, know, you meet a stakeholder for the first time and you say, we're gonna do data governance and this is what it is. Now, I hope you probably get the impression by now that I'm fairly passionate about data governance, but let's face it, it's a dry and boring title. And if you focus it on explaining what this data governance thing is, believe me, very few people are gonna get excited about it. However, if you start with why you're doing it, people are interested and they start asking you questions about how you're going to do that. And this approach is really important for so many things, but it's vital for data governance. So before you dive in and do anything else, I really would encourage you, whether you're doing minimal data governance or, or the full thing, stop and take time to work out why your organization should be doing it. Once you've worked out your why, you can start looking at the benefits that you want to get from data governance. This is obviously going to be closely linked to your why. And the benefits are going to be unique to your organization. And you have to work out what's in it for your organization. But I thought we could kind of have a quick look at the generic kind of or typical benefits that I have seen realized in practice. So you've got things like improved efficiency and reduced cost that comes from mistakes not being made. Now, I often do some work with a chap who likes to use the term swivel chair integration. And it's a brilliant one. It, it sums up where systems don't talk to each other and we literally copy across from one system and you've got somebody sitting there manually typing it into another one. You know, you have to say to yourself, how much time is lost on that kind of activity at your organization or maybe even people disagreeing and arguing over figures and, and checking things? That kind of leads nicely to the next one, which is accurate reporting. Now, I'm an eternal optimist and, and generally I look for the good in people. And I do get that there are some bad people out there, but generally people don't make the wrong decisions deliberately. But I do believe that they're quite frequently given reports that contain the wrong data or poor quality data. And, and you know, as a result, they make bad decisions based on that. And I actually did some work for a company last year who closed down one part of their business, believing it to be unprofitable, and subsequently found out the data was not correct. You know, you don't want to be in that position. So, you know, depending on which sector you work in, perhaps you do want your main benefit to be facilitating compliance with regulation. You know, we, we, I'd always rather we sold the benefits of, of doing it to your organization, but sometimes you have to use that stick approach that you have to comply with a regulation that demands that you have data governance. And therefore that's gonna be one of the benefits that you are looking to achieve. And the next one is that it protects your reputation with customers and suppliers. You know, we all get annoying instances of poor data quality. And, you know, my pet peeve is companies who put an H in my name when there isn't one. But, you know, to be honest, far, far bigger things go wrong as a part of poor quality data. And I, I did some data governance for an organization a few years ago whose major supplier actually got to the stage where they said the data they received from that company was so bad and it caused them so many problems and wasted so much time and effort that they were gonna to refuse to supply them in six months time if they didn't sort their data out. I mean, can you imagine being in that position? The next benefit is supporting your strategy. Now I'm talking about corporate strategy here. If you have a data, fab, um, data strategy, that's fabulous. Um, but that should be aligned to your corporate strategy anyway. And this is all about your organization um, helping them deliver 
their corporate strategy. And having data governance in place enables that. You know, perhaps you want a single version of the truth and you want, a, you know, a single customer view or a single supplier view. But believe me, you cannot do master data management successfully without data governance. And then this final benefit, I only added to my list of generic benefits last year. Um, I'd been talking to a few companies who were saying things along the lines of, the trouble is everybody wants to jump on the bandwagon of AI, machine learning, data science and analytics. They have these massive data sets, but they don't necessarily understand them very well. And they want to create new products or make decisions based on these data sets. And, and that was like worrying their data governance teams. And it was when I was working with a few of my clients that we worked out that actually having data governance in place enables you to use some of these innovative approaches safely and at a pace without diving in and making bad decisions on high volumes of bad data. So, you know, there's lots of benefits there. Not all of them will apply to you. And you might think of others because, as I said at the um, start, you know, successful data governance is always going to be unique to each organization. And not every organization is going to achieve the same benefits. It's going to be why you need to do data governance more than anything else. So once you've identified which benefits you think are going to be the key ones for your organization, it's now time to go and manage the expectations of your senior stakeholders. Now, I kind of already mentioned I've been doing data governance for 17 years now, but even if you went back just five years ago, most people that I went and spoke to hadn't heard of data governance. I had to go and explain everything from scratch. Now, when you go and talk to senior stakeholders these days, they're likely to have heard of data governance. And even worse, they've likely to heard it can do these wonderful things. Now, if we're going to do data governance taking a minimal approach, We've got to manage those expectations because we just can't do everything. So having identified why we're doing it, which benefits we're going to focus on achieving initially, we need to sit down with our senior stakeholders and explain why we're going to have to do a very focused delivery. I also think we need to kind of talk to them and, and manage their expectations about how long it's going to take. Data governance takes a long time. And I'm afraid the bad news is that minimal data governance also takes a long time. I really you know, can't see how you can get any value from it by trying to do it quickly. Because if you do, you won't do it properly. And therefore, you won't deliver any value. So there was no point doing it. Um, and as I've already said, once or twice, it's going to make it harder to do it right the next time. So just because it's minimal doesn't mean it's going to take less time. And we need to be very clear about this in front, up front with our stakeholders because otherwise they're going to get bored and they're going to wonder why we haven't delivered these amazing results next week for them. You need to use these conversations while you're sitting with your stakeholders to get them to focus on and agree the benefits that you're going to focus on delivering. When we went through this slide um, a couple of minutes ago, you might have been nodding your head to all of these benefits, but believe me, you can't deliver all of them if you're taking a minimal data governance approach. So I would say identify one priority benefit, because if you get data governance in place to deliver that correctly, some of the other benefits are gonna start coming through anyway, and then you're gonna be in a good position to start focusing on delivering more of them. Now that you've done that, you're gonna, in a, you're in a big position, good position, sorry, to define your scope. We know why we're going to do it. We know what benefits we're going to focus on, but we're still going to have to limit our scope. So we might decide that we need to look at customer data, but we might say, well, you know, we've got lots of customer data. That's still a big data set. So it might be that we have to limit our focus to a subset of customer data or maybe just finance data, because we've got to work out what's the data causing us the most pain so that we can um, address those. I've always thought that um, the best way of doing data governance is doing it incrementally. Um, so I, I always thought that was a good approach anyway, but with data governance, doing it as a minimal approach, I think we really need to be even more tightly defined on our scope, make it very minimal to begin with. Because then once we've managed to deliver that, we're in a really good place to roll it out further. Now, you might have been getting a bit kind of restless thinking, well, she hasn't started just doing any data governance now. But all that preparatory work was absolutely vital. But having done that, finally, you, you can actually start designing your data governance framework. Now, 
you know, I teach whole training courses on this, so I can't tell you in five minutes what you need to do exactly. But what I do want to say is in my experience, a good data governance framework has three things. It has a policy, because if you don't have a policy that mandates doing data governance, however minimally, people just won't do it. And probably now more than ever, because there are so many changing priorities that we're battling with. And we need to make it clear that somebody senior at your organization has mandated that we are going to govern, you know, a, even if it's a limited amount of data. We need to get that in a policy now. Now, I would say it doesn't have to be a lengthy document. It can be a very short policy. I just think you need something to get this started. You're going to need some processes. And which processes you're going to have is going to very much depend on what you've defined in the previous steps and what are you focusing on at the moment. But in my experience, if we don't have any processes, people tend not to do things consistently. And we need to make sure they do, because otherwise data governance won't help actually solve any problems. And there is a danger. It might even create some more. And then the big thing you have is um, defined roles and responsibilities, because I'm sure you've all been to the same meetings that I have. And we all agree on an action that's going to be taken. And we're in total agreement. Then we come to the next meeting and Andy says, why didn't you do that, Nicola? And I go, oh, I thought Tarek was doing it. And we all look at everybody else. And, it, you know, that's exactly what happens with data governance. Everybody thinks it sounds like a really good idea as long as somebody else is doing it. So we need some very clear defined roles and those responsibilities. And, you know, and that doesn't go away just because we're taking a minimal approach. I really cannot see how data governance can be successful if we don't have our defined roles and responsibilities. And then the final thing I'd say about the framework is when you're designing your framework now, you're absolutely designing it from your minimal data governance point of view. But I think you need to be planning for the future. View this as just the start and because you don't want to be designing a framework that needs to be ripped up and replaced next year or in two years' time. This is about designing something that can evolve and grow with your organization over the coming years as you extend your data governance framework. Now, if you thought that was a quick overview, this is an even quicker one. <laughs> Once you've designed your framework, you're going to have to decide what you're actually going to deliver. Now, again, this is something I spend a little longer on when I'm delivering training, but I tend to summarize the things that you will have if you're doing data governance that you perhaps wouldn't have had beforehand as data governance deliverables. Because I'll be honest, I didn't really know what to call them, and data governance stuff doesn't sound very professional. Um, so I have eight data governance deliverables, one of which we've already just spoken about, which is your policy. Um, and the policy describes what you're going to do to, to manage your data. The next one I've got there is the operating model. Now, I believe that this is one or maybe many documents, depending on how your organization prefers to do it. But they're the detail. They support the policy by giving you detailed descriptions of what will be done. So it could be role descriptions or detailed processes. Now, I think if you're going to be doing minimal data governance, you probably don't want to be going for onerous documentation, but you're going to need enough to support what you're doing. So that's just something to bear in mind. Now, lots of people these days have heard of a data glossary or a data catalog, so I'm not going to bore you with a lengthy description of this, but it just provides the definitions of your data and details what the data can be used for, who the data owner is, useful things like that. Now, one very valuable um, data governance deliverable is data lineage. It has great value, but is often neglected. And it's the graphic representation of how data flows. So it might show data coming into your organization via your website, then it goes through an order system, then maybe to an inventory system, and then finally to the data warehouse. Now, having all this documented is really useful, but I will be honest and say in my experience, it's something that most people only do when there's a regulatory requirement for them to do that. And I'd also say I think it's quite a mature thing to do in terms of data governance. And I wouldn't necessarily recommend that you do that if you're taking a minimal approach, unless it's important for delivering whatever your benefit is. So if you've decided that putting data quality uh, reports is in place is one of your priorities, um, so you can perhaps look at improving the quality of the data, you're going to need some data quality rules because we can't produce reports if we haven't got rules to measure against. Um, and then the reports will tell us the exceptions of what doesn't meet those rules. There's um, 
as I already probably hinted at in the previous slide, loads of processes that you could put in place. But at this stage, the one process I would encourage you to have is um, a data quality issue resolution process. Now, I may have mentioned data governance takes a long time and it, it really doesn't look good. If you stand there saying, oh, I'm going to help you improve the quality of your data, but give me six months to a year and you know, then we might actually get around to delivering some data quality reports. You need to be able to do things now to help improve poor data quality. And that's where this process comes in because it allows people to notify you of issues that they have. You can prioritize them, start fixing them long before we're able to do any data quality reporting. And before perhaps we've even got a data glossary in place. So I really do think this is a good one to do. And if you only put in place one process as part of your minimal data governance, please, please make it this one. Finally, under deliverables, I've got uh, risks and controls around your data. And to be honest, if you're doing a minimal data governance approach, you probably want to ignore this one. It's another one um, that you might need to look at for regulatory requirements. But it's something where you tend to be fairly mature and it looks at the risk to data and what can be done to mitigate them. And that normally comes later on in our data governance journey when we've got a better understanding of our data through both having the glossary, the data lineage. So unless you're using your minimal data approach to extend a data governance framework, I wouldn't really worry about risk controls at this stage. Now, even under normal circumstances, I would be telling you we couldn't do all these things at once. And I'd be working out a plan for when we're rolling out different things over a reasonable period of time. But for a minimal approach, I think you really need to focus on which of these you need to put in place to deliver the benefits that you've already agreed. Please don't try and do everything. Um, you know, And I'm not telling you to just pick one or two of these and ignore the rest forever. I'm just saying for this first initial implementation, just use carefully because you're going to be asking the business to spend time helping you with this. You can't do it all for them. And you don't want to be asking them to do too much. And particularly, if you've called it a minimal data governance approach, you can't then go to the business with a big list of things you want them to do. So we're probably getting to the important question is, can minimal data governance really be effective? Well. Yes, I think it can. I think it's probably the way I've been increasingly approaching data governance over recent years. And what I'm encouraging you all to do is to be even more pragmatic and, and focused than I usually am. But I think if you do that, you should be able to deliver something on an inadequate budget that can deliver some real value to your organization. But I just think that to be effective, you really need to bear three things in mind. Be very focused on your scope. You know you should never be doing data governance over everything. But right now, let's have a really narrow scope and let's focus on just the one thing. Then we can focus on doing it properly. And, and just remember, minimal data governance doesn't mean let's do it quick and dirty. Do it properly, just with a limited scope. And then finally, do it in a way that's planning for the future. Do it to deliver some very focused benefits now, but in a way that the framework can be evolved and implemented across your organization in the future. Make sure whatever you do, that it's gonna deliver some benefits now, but that you can scale it. You don't want to have to revisit and do this again in the future. So, you know, to wrap it up, well, the presentation bit up, it's not called minimal data governance, but on my website, there's a higher level free checklist that takes you through some of the steps that I think you should take when implementing data governance. And I think if you take on board the points that I've covered in this session, you'll be able to go through that checklist and decide which bits that you do and don't want to do. So please feel free to, to go and download that there. And uh, you've probably got the impression I love talking about data governance. So if you want to connect with me in any way to, to carry on talking about data governance, please feel free. Now I'm going to end the slides so that we can talk a bit more and put Tarek on the spot. <laughs> oh dear! <laughs> yeah, but before we uh, before we ask uh, some uh, questions of Tarek, I just wanted to mention the fact that this session will be available on demand uh, almost as soon as it's finished. To be honest, so if there's any points in uh, Nicholas' presentation you want to go over, or any slides that you want to go over, then you can uh, pick it up on demand and uh, do a, a rewind fast forward as you like. Um, also in the bottom left hand corner, you'll see a, a link to some attachments and in those attachments are Nicola's uh, slides that she's just 
shown, uh, which is shared on here uh, very kindly. So if you want to download them, they're, they're freely available in the bottom left. Um, however, uh, moving on, uh, it's time to uh, interrogate uh, Tarek some, somewhat. So um, I, thought, I thought about starting with um, what you're doing now and, um, you know, why data governance is important. So you're working at Nursing and Midwifery Council. I'm That's guessing right. nearly everybody has to interact with you at least once in their life. Um, so, uh, yes. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> Especially over the last couple of months, that's definitely the case. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, with data governance, um, I was very much at the other end of the spectrum where Nicola came from. So Nicola was basic, you know, in terms of Nicola, she was very much of an evangelist, very much of a, we need to get it right. Everything needs to be right. I would have probably annoyed her quite a lot in my early days saying that, why do we bother with it? Because that's my approach. When I first started my data career was that, um, was that I didn't appreciate data governance because I actually didn't appreciate the value that it brought. Yeah. And it only, and it only, and what actually enlightened me about it was basically when I was working in Southern Water and then I was working with a person named James Palmer. Um, he was the head of data governance at the time within, uh, within Southern Water um, and within the team that I was working in. And he really, really put it in perspective to me in terms of what data governance is. And 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 ever since then, I have been, you know, an evangelist for data governance because within the NMC, what we, we you know, in our data governance board, in terms of our terms of reference, what we had defined it as is that there were four things that data governance needs to do, okay? And it's very, very similar towards what um, what Nicola was talking about in terms of policy, process, roles, and responsibilities, you know, that, you know, in that, in that, in that context of framework. However, in terms of our terms of reference, what we have said, okay, and, and this is to ensure that, you know, for me, the, about data governance, this is ensuring that we're helping the business to help themselves. Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah, we're not here to own the data, the, the data problems of the business, but at the same time, we want to help them try to alleviate as much of it, especially when it comes to processes and roles and responsibilities and so on and so forth. But coming back, in terms of what how we define data governance within the NMC is in, is in four things. One is one is def, is defined. So basically, we need to define the data quality that's there. Yeah. What is this? And this is coming back to what she was saying, you know, bringing it into scope, making sure that we identifying these sorts of things. Next, all right, actually, I just said the word, but the next bit is about identification. What is the data quality issue? What is, what is the stuff that is going to bring value? You know, are we going to be focusing things that are, that are 10 years old or are we going to be focusing things over here and now? Is it the sorts of things that we need to focus on in the last three years? Because these are the things that we are using to do forecasting, to use in our, in our data science, in our data lake, and so on and so forth. The next bit is advice, yeah? All of this, okay, has to come in with, with very good experience and, and with advice of how to make things better, yeah? So, you know, it, we were talking, Nicola was very, very poignant about, you know, what, you know, we have to, explain the why, the how, and the what. So, you know, once you get into the why, which is the, the definition and the identification, the how it comes into, you know, in terms of the advice, yeah? You need to have that sort of structure to give the advice. And then finally, all right, in terms of, to, to tie these all things together, it's about prevention and monitoring, yeah? As Nicholas said, you're not going to do this in day one. This is it's impossible. This is an ongoing thing, whether you're going for the maximum of data governance or a minimal stance, this has to be ongoing. This has to be future proof. You have to continuously want to better yourself. So for instance, we are adapting the ISO 8000 approach on data quality. So we know that at this present moment in time, I'm not gonna reveal what level we are, but there are five levels in, in that approach. So you always continuing you continue to self-improve yourself and self-improve the data, helping the business, helping that to bring that value throughout that particular time. And through prevention and monitoring, this is where I believe, you know, the believe that in terms of how Nicola says that in her framework, we have policies, process, and roles and responsibilities. 
for me, you know, data governance is part of the overall data process of what I call data rocks. And that is all about people, process, and technology. So with the prevent and monitoring, that will kind of like bring that whole, whole 360 view together and then con that continuous interaction with the business so that you know that you're going through the right direction. Um, I'm just looking at the questions and actually there's a question saying that where does business pro uh, process mapping come in and would you need to know where the process of data is collected and used? Absolutely, because you do not want to build a business process and then all of a sudden if the data is so critical and you left it as a free text box. Hang on. You're already um, preparing yourself up to fail because as humans, we would write anything and everything in that free textbook than what we what, what than what the exact um, expected answer would be. So as you're doing your business processes and everything else, again, it's about the scope of that business process. And again, as much as you can, if you need to derive any data from it or any reports from that data or looking at the metadata and everything else. This is where you have to do the data analysis. This is where it is at that point of time. So within the NMC, we are going through a digital transformation program. And you know, it was very before I came along, it was very business process. It was because we want they wanted to get the business process right. But when we came in, by myself and my team came into our digital transformation program, we start focusing to make sure that we turn off the bad data tap and turn on the good one by implementing things like drop down lists and stuff like that. So, you know, in terms of what we are doing in NMC, we are going through a long journey. This is not something that will that we, you know, that you know, that we said all our data is clean because we're never going to, you know, as much as I want to achieve perfection, you know, it that's never going to happen, but what I, what, I, what we were trying to do is the preventative measure, the monitoring measure, and if it brings value um, do it with some retrospective fixes. Excellent, excellent. Thank you very much, Tarek. That's uh, that was very clear. Uh, there's been a good question come in actually, and I was going to put it to you first, Tarek, um, and uh, then then to you, Nicola. Um, you mentioned how uh, sort of management board level, those sort of th people, suddenly started um, taking it a little bit more seriously over the last five years. Um, one of the questions is like, how do you get technology focused teams to understand how critical it is? So not the not the higher ups who understand, you know, um, you know the, the the negative connotations that can come with doing this badly. Um, I suppose, you know, I won't mention the job titles that they're probably <laughs> they're, they're probably referring to, but you know, the people who are, you know, dealing with the data day to day and and, and you know and very tech technology focused, especially when they're at home as well. I mean, yeah. how how do you convince them that this is, you know? very very important that they they've listened to this kind of a message so the way i approach these sort of people because i was that sort of person as well <laughs> was, uh, was actually um it's what it's what i said i think i said it previously and and i've always been an advocate on this one it's like you know you have to treat data governance like you are in fight club so yeah i hope everybody knows the, the from fight club you know that's kind of like you know the first rule of fight club is that you don't talk about fight club the second rule of Fight Club, you don't talk about Fight Club. So you apply the same mantra with data governance, yeah? Because actually nine times out of 10, they don't realize that, that, that what data governance brings, they're actually doing so far. So for instance, within the NMC, we have um, FOI requests, you know, freedom of information, yeah? And we have to go through certain processes in order to make sure that we deliver on the FOI at a, at a, at a period of length of time. So, you know, when, in the end of the day, what, what happens is that that FOI will come to a technologies person, to, will come to a database developer or a BI developer or however you want to put it, in order to get that data. Now, a well-governed, you know, a well, well-managed, well-governed data will be able to turn that FOI very, very quickly because you know where to get it. The definitions have already been found. You don't have to consider. So, for instance, in the NMC. We don't, we don't have to consider the word registrants. So the, for the, the definition of registrants for us is basically nurses, midwives, and nursing associates. But if you go for someone like the GMC, registrants means doctors. So you have these two definitions. But when an FOI comes across to that, because if you have a well-established data governance practice and you're, and you're buying by it, no matter how technology-focused you are, the turnaround time to deliver a particular report, especially as important as an FOI, 
becomes a reality. And that's what, and that's for me, how you get a technology focused team to see, to start seeing the benefits of delivering that. It's by, as I said, not talking about data governance, but as Nicholas was saying, talking about the whys and keep talking about the whys so that they can see the value that's being added to their processes and everything else that's behind it. Perfect, perfect. Is there anything you can add there, uh, Nicholas? Uh, I don't know, Tarek's put it really, really well. Um, I think <laughs> the only thing I would say is, is exactly um, what, what you just said, Tarek. Um, I do like the Fight Club mantra. I might have to start using that one. Um, <laughs> It is the it's the why, and the why is going to be different for absolutely everybody you talk to in your organization. And I don't think that you should um, go and talk to anybody without preparing it kind of thing. So, you know, I need to go, oh, I'm going to go and see Andy. Does he work in a tech role? What's his team do? What are their challenges? What do they suffer from? And how is me putting in place data governance, whatever we call it, and whatever we don't mention it, going to help them? Because if I can't help you, um, you know, I've been known to say, particularly if I'm helping um, clients brief data owners and things like that, you know, I tend to get caught, brought in to help do the, the challenging people. And I've been known to, you know, if I was sitting there with Tarek, I'd be going. And the thing is, Andy, you know, if putting data governance in place makes your life worse or more complicated, we're doing it wrong. And you can you can have a go at Tarek. I've given you permission to do that. And it's really funny how that kind of gets people go. Oh, OK. So we're not asking you to do loads of extra work for just for the fun of it, because we thought it would be good. We, we've got we've got to work out before we talk to everybody what the benefit for them is because if we haven't done that preparation then the chances are yeah we're not going to convince them we'll just go oh, great that just sounds like more work and i don't have time for that that's right no <laughs> that, absolutely that's right um yeah and as i said nine times out of ten they're actually doing the work so when i was working um a few companies ago i'm not going to mention the company but there was this one person that was in particular really enjoyed the process of copying things from a database putting into an excel spreadsheet and then having formulas on it, and then producing the graph, and then they will take the whole week just to produce that particular report. And by the time that they produced that report, the actual job of doing the analysis was about half a day's work on a Friday in the afternoon after yeah. doing that whole whole complete you know job. And then when you, and then because they've been doing that for so so long, it's that when you take away and start saying to them, actually, you know, there's better ways of doing this because actually we could automate this process, this that the other. People get scared because the role that they've been brought on upon to do that sort of work, to do the analysis, has turned out to be some kind of ETL spreadsheet sort of work. And they've been doing it day in, day out for a number of years. And you and then you then adding that amount of change and you bring that about change towards them, people will get scared. People will get very protective. They'll think that this is my job. And then it's again, it's, it's, you know, you're defining the roles and responsibility of data governance, but it's also crucial to define the roles and responsibility of that person who's doing the job in the first place. So that when you bring about change and everything else, it becomes more welcoming and accepting rather than, you know, you're trying to fight back. Because like, like I said, that person had very well intentions, very good of doing whatever that, what they were doing. And as Nicholas said, nobody's ever, you know, Everybody's always doing things in good intentions. There was never a thing of something that's bad. However, you know, if you bring it into scope and bring it back to what they will be doing in the future and get them excited about that, and then afterwards you're saying that, yeah, this is what data governance is bring, people then get excited and come on board a lot more quicker to change than when you're saying than not trying to put down the policy stick and go, Whoosh, you have to do it like this. <laughs> Very true. So um I was I was going to say I, I know you covered this a little bit, um, Nicola. Um, well, not a little bit. You covered it uh, quite conclusively and with with lots of different points and stuff. But um, um, if there's people on the call who are listening at the moment who perhaps aren't doing enough, they feel that governance. You know, that's why they're on the call. You know, they, they're they're looking at, at revamping what they're doing or maybe starting starting afresh, starting a, a new program. Um, sort of first steps for them. What 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 should they think about straight away? Um, you know, uh, uh, when they're when they're implementing this uh, program. Well, I think an absolute first step is is make sure you got permission to do it, because <laughs> I, you know, it, it sounds really really obvious, but I mean, in the early days, I mean, I had my boss's permission, but I also had the proviso. Don't don't get 
me into trouble, don't upset anybody senior, and I may have got thrown out of one or two senior people's offices over the years, but, <laughs> the first couple of years. Um, but I think it is that make sure you've got somebody senior supporting you and saying we need to do this, um, particularly now more than ever if people are questioning what you're doing and is it going to help and everything. Um, and then I, I was going to say I, I really don't think you can miss out that why step. That is the absolute vital thing because otherwise you cannot explain why you should be doing it and you can't work out where you should be focusing. I think that is the absolutely important one. People get sidetracked by all these more exciting things that you can do with data, like your AI, your, your data science analytics, um, and they want to dive into them. But we, if we don't know why we're going to use our data, they're going to be a disaster. If we don't have data governance on place that, over that data before they do it, it's going to be a disaster. So I think actually... Yeah, the, the why is really, really important, but make sure you've got a, a senior sponsor backing you up, doing it on a best endeavors basis just because you listen to a, a webinar with a mad data governance woman and thought, oh, I'll do some of that. It's probably not going to get you very far. You need somebody supporting you. Yeah. Would you back that up, uh, Tariq? Uh, no, uh, no, absolutely. Um, you know, it's about influencing the right people and getting the right people backing, absolutely. And mm -hmm. it's all about the why and the value. You know, those are the two the two critical things. I think I, I think Nicola, you know, if if anyone wants to take away anything from, from her presentation, it's all about the why and the value. You know, if you can't remember anything else, always stick to those two principles. Because if you if you define the whys and you define the values, um, everything else will, will become easy everything you know in terms of buying from from buy-ins from from senior stakeholders etc cetera, etc cetera, it's about having that tangible and sometimes getting that tangible will be a bit hard will be a difficult journey for people to go to by all means it's not easy so when i started in the nmc it took me six months just to get to a tangible product yeah mm -hmm. in terms of data governance so it wasn't something that was totally easy that you know that you could just come up with within the day however once you do get there it is about cheerleading it is about you know about going into i'm um, going to people getting people you know as i said if they don't like data governance don't talk about it as data governance talk about it as the value for the business as the why for the business and then afterwards once you start having that sort of buy-in then afterwards you go this is data governance and then it will go then the light bulb will click and then hopefully things will then roll together but do look at it as a long-term thing and not a short-term yeah you have to play the long game when it comes to data governance and when you want to do things right you got to play the long-term game and not the short Perfect. Yeah. And I the other one thing I would, would add is, um, you know, COVID-19 has, has changed all our lives this year and, and made a big thing. But I think from talking to some of my clients that it's actually created opportunities for you to explain the value of data governance. So yeah. I, I've spoken to at least two clients in the last week that have had been told you've got to suspend your data governance work at the moment and help out on this urgent new project that's come out as a result of COVID-19. And what you know the projects themselves were different in their nature but they both ended up meaning you had to contact your clients and these were both businesses that to be honest didn't need to contact their clients very often <laughs> but now they suddenly needed to contact them all and then they suddenly realized how many email addresses were missing how many weren't formatted correctly or how many weren't valid and they suddenly went oh we can't contact our clients and we never realized that and and so and, and both of them that i was talking to were saying no no those projects are over um, and they're allowed to go back to data governance they have actually used the other work they were doing to highlight the importance of what data governance was giving them so i would say Look, I mean, and, and you've got good examples of that, Tarek, haven't you? I know from previous conversations of, you know, what you have to do in response to the current COVID situation actually is actually strengthening the case for data governance. No, absolutely. No, absolutely. Um, so um, with the COVID-19 situation, um, we had to enact a emergency register so that people that have either retired or left nursing for whatever reason it is, and they're within a certain criteria, they'd be able to register themselves onto the emergency register and then able to be on the front line, front line or however it is, you know, to help with the COVID-19 situation. One of the, but within the within the free the within i would say that you know if it wasn't for our data governance process in there and for that and for the talented team that was behind you know delivering um the emergency register we wouldn't be able to turn that around in three weeks 
I could honestly hand on heart say that we wouldn't have that. We, you know, we had data quality issues. We had policies issues. We had to revisit everything. We had, you know, we had this thing called like gold command, whereby you know people were making you know executable decisions on a daily basis. So on and so forth. We had to, you know, really, really, you know, turn it around. But what it has really highlighted the benefits of having a data ops process, a data governance process, you know, bringing this all things together to turn around such a, a, you know, to turn around, for instance, fourteen thousand are um, now strong registrants into this emergency register in such a short period of time. You know, I'm, I'm not saying that it was perfect at all. It had its challenges and everything, but because of the processes that were there, and and then we're continuing to evolve on those processes. You know, things were, we were able to turn things around in a much quicker time than we previously would be able to. Think about it. When we first thinking about it, when we first entered this COVID-19 situation, you know, we wanted. You know, there was an idea. There was an expectation, not an idea. There was an expectation to actually deliver it in an Excel spreadsheet. And I was like, no, no, we can't be delivering this on an Excel spreadsheet. We, we can actually do better. And because of what we have in process and everything else, we were able to deliver such a much better product. Perfect, perfect. Well, actually my final question was going to be around the, uh, the, the, the COVID situation and you've both uh, answered it without me asking it. So, <laughs> it's, a, so it's a well done uh, predictive AI in, uh, in, in <laughs> in action there um yeah so yeah it, you know the, the the story is that you know there's there's things that we can be doing even when we're apart and you know it's it, it's highlighting issues why you need more more data governance um you know in in this sort of current climb i i guess um i was actually like i said i think that was going to be my last question so i think i might uh, uh wrap things up for now um, but I'd like to say a massive thank you to um, to Nicola and Tarek. I've, I've really enjoyed the conversation. I really enjoyed the presentation. Um, Nicola said in her presentation that data governance, governance isn't interesting. And I, I'd like to think that um, both of you have disproved that to, to a certain extent. I've really enjoyed the, the conversation. It's been a, it's been good to hang out. And um, I hope everybody at home has enjoyed it, too. Um, like I said, in the attachments on the bottom left, we've got links to our upcoming webinars. Um, including um, the first part of a three-part one with Databricks, which is coming up next week. Um, and yeah, if, if you missed the start of this one and you mess, missed the reminder uh, halfway through and you'd like to catch up, this will be available on demand you know, in a moment, to be honest. Um, so you can go back and, and, and watch anything that you've missed. Um, but in the meantime, um, yeah, another big thanks to our presenters. Um, and it, it, it's goodbye from all of us. So uh, Good goodbye, guys. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you very much.